I'm going to show you how to use Postgres functions to run a series of SQL statements in a transaction. Even better, we're going to use RPC to call this function from our Next.js application, meaning we don't need to bake a bunch of logic about our database and how to keep the data consistent into our app. We can just call the function to do the thing and move on. Now, you may have seen some recent drama about why database functions are a terrible idea. You may have also seen a bunch of responses about why it's a great idea and unrealistic to do it any other way for performance reasons. So let's look at why it's awesome, and then you can make the call for whether it's right for what you're building. But firstly, what is a transaction? A transaction is a way to group together a collection of related statements that all need to succeed in order for our data to still make sense. The classic example is bank accounts, where you want to transfer money from one account to another. This is multiple steps as we need to subtract money from one account and add money to the other account. If we take money out of this account and then something unexpected happens to our database, we now have inconsistent data and we've actually lost someone's money. Data loss or corruption is basically the worst possible thing that can happen to the most valuable asset of your company. It's data. So don't do that. That being said, if we add money to this account first and then something happens to the database, we've actually created extra money and everyone gets rich. Wait, f forget I said that. Don't steal my startup idea. But all jokes aside, both of these steps need to happen in order to keep the data consistent. So we can wrap them in a transaction, which will ensure that each step runs successfully. Otherwise, it will automatically roll back or undo any of those changes that have been made. So jumping back into our email client example, this is based on an awesome project from Lee Robertson at Vercel. In the last video, we refactored the data fetching logic to use views and a hosted Superbase instance. I'll leave links to all of that in the description. But in this video, we're going to focus solely on the mutations or the actions that the user can perform. So there's no need to watch those other ones first, but they're there if you want to go deeper. So this is our email client. We have a list of folders, the emails that are in that folder. And then if we click on one of these, we have the contents of the email. We have some actions that we can perform up here. And in this video, we're just going to focus on these two. So the ability to send an email and the ability to delete an email. Now looking at the code, this has been nicely organized into this single file called actions.ts, which has a function for sending an email and another one for deleting an email. So to send an email, we're just doing some validation to make sure the user has sent the right stuff. Then we're connecting to the database. So we get back a database client. We're then sending a query to begin, which signifies the start of our transaction. And then we have a few steps that need to succeed in order to keep all of our data consistent. So firstly, back up here, we are selecting the ID from the users table where the email matches the email that's been sent to this function. So we know the user's email, but we want to look up their ID. Now, if the user doesn't exist, which is what this check is doing, then we want to insert a new user using that email and get back that user's ID. So then our recipient ID variable will either be the user that already existed or the new user that we've created. So now that we have the recipient's ID, we can send an email by inserting a new email into the emails table and sending across the values for our sender ID. So that one's hard coded above because this example doesn't implement authentication or it doesn't yet, but stay tuned for the next video where we'll implement this using Superbase auth. So along with that hard-coded value for our sender, we're also passing across the recipient ID, the subject of our email, the body of our email, and a timestamp for right now. So that's the time that this email was sent. And then we're returning the new email's ID so that we can use it in the next statement. So now that the email has been sent, we need to add it to the sent folder. So we know that the folder is called sent, but because this lives in its own table called folders, we need to look up the ID so we can associate our new email with that specific folder. So then we insert a new row into the email folders table with the value for our new email and the ID for the sent folder. We then send this query to commit, which means everything succeeded. So let's apply those changes. Otherwise, if something went wrong, we fall into this catch block and we want to roll back any of those changes. And finally, we want to release or disconnect from the database. And then because we may have mutated data, we want to revalidate or go and fetch fresh data for everything on the root layout and then redirect to our new email. That was a lot, but really there are two main steps here. Insert a row into the emails table and insert a row into the email folders table. Everything else is just collecting up the right data to be able to do that and ensuring it runs in a transaction, rolling back any changes if there were problems along the way. And we can see what this looks like from a user's perspective. So if they want to send a new email to tyler at superbase.com with the subject, great job, exclamation mark, and the body, that new Android content is absolute fire emoji. And we can click send 
to send this email. And you can see it's taking a little while because there's a lot of steps that are running in that transaction. And we can see that new email has been added to our sent folder and we can see the contents of it there. So it's successfully been added to our database. So what's the problem here? Well, the Next.js application is the thing that's responsible for ensuring our data remains in sync. So once we insert a new email, we need to remember to also insert it into the email folders table. And this needs to run in a transaction to ensure our data remains consistent. But there's nothing stopping a new dev or even the same dev after a couple of days of not working on this project from writing a new function called send faster email that inserts a new email without a transaction or any of the other steps we need to keep the data across our tables in sync. This maybe isn't the end of the world for an email client application. It would probably just be considered a bug that we could fix down the line. But with the bank example from earlier, this could be a really expensive problem. Anything this critical to the consistency of your data should probably be enforced at the database level, making it much harder to make these kinds of mistakes. Additionally, this looks like it's making several requests to the database. We wait for this transaction to begin, then we select some data, we insert some data, we insert some more data, we select some more data, we insert some more data, and then finally commit these changes. I'm not sure if bundling this up as a single query is handled behind the scenes, but given we are awaiting each of these steps, to complete, it looks like we're making seven requests from our application to our database just to ensure that a couple of values across a couple of tables are kept in sync. Let's move this logic from our application to the database, meaning we only need to send a single request across that network boundary and we can put the responsibility for consistent data on the database itself. We can do this with a Postgres function. So from the Superbase dashboard, let's head over to the SQL editor and we can ask Superbase AI, create an empty Postgres function called send underscore email that returns an int. And this looks good, so we'll accept that change. And then we're creating or replacing a function called send underscore email. We can specify some parameters that this takes as we need them. It returns an int because we need that email ID to redirect our user. We're then declaring that function as, and then we have the body of our function or the steps we actually want to run, which sit between these dollar signs, which conveniently runs as a transaction and automatically handles rolling back if anything goes wrong. And lastly, we specify the language, which is PLPG SQL, which is just SQL with some convenient programmy things like if statements and the ability to declare variables, both of which we're going to need to send this email. So we just need to make this begin and end lowercase so my code isn't screaming at me and then replace this return zero statement with the statements that we want to run within our transaction. So I'm going to use the magic of editing to paste all of those in here, just like that, and then some more editing magic to make it stop yelling at us in all caps. Ah, much nicer. So we're selecting the ID for the user. If they don't exist, we're inserting a new user. Then we're inserting or sending out email, then getting the ID for the sent folder, and then inserting that email into that folder. But we've still got all of these JavaScripty variables. So let's refactor those to work in our Postgres function. So this one is the recipient's email, which can be passed into this function as a parameter. So recipient underscore email, which is of type text. And then let's just add some spaces around this equal sign. And now we're getting back our users ID, but we need a place to store it to be able to use it in this statement to insert our new email. So let's add a declare section above begin. And so this is where we can declare our variables to remember values between statements. So we want to remember our recipient underscore ID, which is of type int. And then we can select this ID into our recipient underscore ID variable. And so now we need to handle the case where the recipient doesn't exist. And so we want to create a new user for them. So we can say if recipient underscore ID is null, then we want to insert this new user and we just need to add an end for our if statement and change this to be our recipient underscore email that got passed in as a parameter. And again, this insert statement is returning an ID. So we just need to put that into our recipient underscore ID variable. So next we want to insert our new email. Our sender ID is going to be hard coded as one, but we'll fix this up in a future video when we implement authentication and authorization. And I just realized I put that in the wrong place anyway. So let's undo. This is the name of our column, sender underscore ID, the value is this one. So then for the value of our recipient ID, this will be our recipient underscore ID variable for our subject and body. We'll need two more parameters that are being passed into our function. So subject, which is of type text and body, which is of type text. And then we can get rid of this stuff and this stuff and this stuff and this stuff and calling the now function will give us back a timestamp for our sent date. 
Again, we need to store this returning ID somewhere. So let's declare a new variable for email underscore ID, which is also gonna be an int. And then we can return this ID into our email underscore ID, which is also the value we want to return at the end of our function. For this next one, we're selecting the ID for the folder with the name sent. So we need somewhere to store this ID. So we'll declare a new variable for folder underscore ID, which is also of type int. And then we want to select ID into folder underscore ID from folders where the name equals sent. And we can even add our spaces around this equal sign to make it look real nice. And then lastly, we want to insert into the email folders table with the values for our email ID and then our folder underscore ID. And again, we're returning the ID for that new email that's been created so we can redirect the user to that new email. And I've just noticed one small typo that we still have parsed.body. So let's get rid of that one and then make this panel a little bit bigger and click run to create our new Postgres function and we see success no rows returned. So everything is all good and we're done. We can forget all about what it takes to keep our data in sync and instead just call this Postgres function from our application, which really just cares about sending the email. So we can get rid of this entire try catch block. We'll keep our revalidation and redirection logic and get rid of this extra bracket. We can also get rid of all of this, but we'll keep our validation logic. Now we just need to create a new Superbase client by calling the create client function, which comes in from dot dot slash utils slash Superbase, which we created in the previous video, but it's just just wrapping a call to the create client function from Superbase JS. So we don't need to copy and paste these environment variables everywhere we want to create a client. So now that we have our Superbase client, we can get some data by awaiting a call to Superbase and we can use RPC or remote procedure call to call our send underscore email function, which lives in Postgres. And this function takes in a collection of parameters. So we had our recipient email, our subject and our body. But these three parameters conveniently map to our past object, which gets a subject, an email and a body and validates that they're all the right shape. So we just need to change the key for email to be recipient underscore email and then the same for the key of our past object and then we can just send that whole object along for the ride to our send email function so this will give us back some data which will be our new email id and also an error object if anything went wrong so if we have an error then we want to log it out to the console to help ourselves with debugging but if everything's all good then we want to revalidate our data and redirect to that new email so let's check this is still working by sending a new email and let's send this to a user who doesn't exist yet. So we'll go Thor at superbase.com. The subject can be Postgres functions are so cool. And in the body, we can say they are efficient and so secure and click send. We get redirected to that new email and the email has been added to the list of emails in our sent folder, meaning each of our steps in that transaction have succeeded. Awesome. Our application code is now significantly more simple. The database is now responsible for keeping things consistent. And we're only making a single request from our application to our database to handle all of that logic. Let's refactor our delete function. So we can see we're creating a new client by connecting to the database. We're then beginning a new transaction. We're selecting the ID from the folders table where the name is this folder name, which we can see is a formatted version of this parameter that's being passed into our function. So we're selecting the ID for that folder name. We're then deleting the row from the email folders table where the email underscore ID matches the email ID that was passed into our function and where the folder underscore ID matches matches the folder ID from our select statement. And then we're deleting that same email from the emails table. So basically this logic is reversed from sending an email. So if we delete an email, we also want to remove it from the email folders table. Now, since these tables have a relationship, we can actually use a cascade delete to do this automatically. So anytime an email is deleted, we can cascade those deletes to the email folders table and remove any rows that have that email's ID. So back over in the Superbase dashboard, we can create a new query. And this one is going to alter the table email underscore folders. We want to drop our existing constraint for email underscore folders underscore email underscore ID underscore F key. So that was a lot, but a constraint is just a set of rules that applies to a relationship across tables.
So we want to drop or delete the existing set of rules. We then want to add a new set of rules or a new constraint, which we want to have the same name. So let's copy that from here and paste. We want to specify a foreign key relationship for the email underscore ID column, which references the emails ID column. And then on delete, we want to cascade. So when a particular ID is deleted from the emails table, we want to cascade those deletes to the email folders table and we can click run and we see success, no rows returned. And now back over in our application, we can again remove this entire try catch and finally block. So let's go all the way up to try and remove. We can get rid of this extra bracket. We wanna keep our revalidation and our redirection logic. And then rather than creating this client by connecting to our database, we want to create a super base client by calling the create client function. And we no longer need to turn our folder name into the title case version. So we can get rid of this and make a little bit of space. And now we can await a call to Superbase. And from the emails table, we can just delete the email that matches the ID field and our email ID that gets passed in as a parameter to this function. Now we don't really care about the data that comes back from this, but we do wanna know if there's an error. And then if we do get an error, so if error, then we want to be kind to our future selves and console log it out. And then we revalidate the path and redirect our user back to that folder. So as we can see, this statement is much simpler where we don't need to think about any of that logic to keep things consistent. We just delete the email and the database can handle whatever that means to keep things consistent. So we can check our application is still working by choosing one of our emails and clicking delete. We can see we no longer see the contents of that email and it's been deleted from our list, confirming that delete statement has been cascaded to that sent folder. And again, we've managed to improve efficiency and security while simplifying our our application code. We've reduced the number of trips that need to happen between our Next.js application and the database and moved the responsibility for keeping data consistent and in sync to the database itself, which should be responsible for that kind of thing. If you want to take this concept even further and learn how you can implement an entire authorization system in the database itself, I recommend you check out this video right here. We use row-level security to lock down access to the database and write policies to enable specific users to be able to access specific data. But until next time, keep building cool stuff.